Welcome to Constant Variables, a podcast where we take a non-technical look at building and growing digital products. I'm Michael Roth. Let's get nerdy. This episode is brought to you by the Jed Mahonis Group, your tech partner for building mobile and web software that grows with you and is also enjoyable to use. You can see some of our recent projects with companies like TurnSignal, Little Free Library, and InSupply by visiting our website at jmg.mn. Hey, Sam. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Michael. Yeah. So Sam is the Senior Director of IT Asset Disposition Processing at Repowered, or ITAD Processing, and admittedly that was one acronym I had to look up when I was getting to know you. Um, But I would love to hear a little bit about your background and kind of what motivates you to be in the position you are. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I um, never had really thought much of um, what happened to e-waste you know that was something i had always used growing up um and like most people don't you know given our our general culture around disposal we don't really give a lot of thought to uh to what happens when it when it leaves our hands um in uh 2008 is when i kind of first got my my start in this world um i don't even know if the acronym itad had really developed yet but um I started volunteering for another local nonprofit that provided um, computers and internet resources um, to low-income families. And I was with that organization for about 10 years. And about four years ago, I came to what was then Tech Dump, but which is now called uh, Repowered, and, um, and really kind of helped um, do a number of things within the organization. Um, everything from just kind of operational production um, of our facility to kind of helping some of our outreach um, and some of our digital um, inclusion initiatives. Sure. And is there one end or the other of that current position that you lean towards enjoying or is all of it super exciting for you? All of it's pretty exciting, but I think I do kind of get the most energy um, from the the digital inclusion side of things as much as I I enjoy operations and things. Um, it's not necessarily something that, um, like I said, you know, in, in the way our careers develop over time, um, operations was never quite something that I thought I'd, I'd get as involved in. Um, but I think my, my passion is really to, to help people. And in my capacity at, at Repowered, um, I really have the, the ability and privilege to kind of help um, to help people um, really in any function that I do within the organization. So um, that that's why I like it so much here. Yeah. I love that. And I think that for me is also a big motivator in work because definitely once you get into a position for more than a year or so, it starts to become that question of, okay, besides profits for the company and a wage for myself, what am I doing here? And kind of having something more valuable or rewarding to you behind that is always awesome. I completely agree. Um, I know you'd mentioned Tech Dump and that previously there was also a Tech Discounts retail retail store associated with you guys. What motivated the rebrand to Repowered? I mean, it's literally in the name. Um, You know, to have the word dump in your name doesn't... uh, (laughs) Is it doesn't for for long term uh, purposes doesn't doesn't really elicit a lot of uh, great brand loyalty for the yeah. reasons you would want. All so right. fair enough. Um, in in 2011, when it really st- when the organization started, it really started originally as an event. There was a tech dump was the name of the event. Um, okay. And then the name just just stuck. Um, and it in a few years later, when we really got beyond just collecting and recycling e-waste um, we realized there was obviously a lot of value still left in the equipment that we were seeing and we that's where we really kind of brought in our refurbishing services um, sure. and and again um, to really um, have some brand loyalty and some confidence in our customers um, people didn't want to buy their equipment from a place called tech dump like it yeah. just it didn't it, right it's just not the right yeah, name for it's... It. 
It's not uh, not giving you the vision of reusing or recycling in any capacity. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, for a long time, like we had fun with the name, um, but but it just kind of came to a point where like, OK, we got to do something a little different here. Um, we weren't ready for a complete rebrand at that point because we, we did have a lot of people know us as as Tech Dump from the from the recycling side of things. So we we kind of spun off the tech discounts brand um, to sell both um, retail and wholesale. Um, okay. And, and that's kind of how that came about. Um, but then the problem of just managing two different brands um, just kind of became apparent. Um, we would, our, our tech dump customers, for example, the ones that were recycling with us, didn't realize that they could come to us and, and buy technology. Um, likewise, the people that were buying from us didn't understand that they could recycle with us. So it really kind of um, came, we, we just hit that point where like, we need to, to get all under one brand again. Um, so, so that's what we did. Um, and we came up with the, uh, the organization repowered and, um, we're still, we're kind of in the, the tail end of that rebrand, all of our, our websites and social media and stuff is live. Um, our trucks and that sort of branding have been, have been done, but we still have a few, um, like signage in our, in our stores that we still are, are in the process of, of changing out. But, um, it, it's it's been great to just not only uh, kind of drop that to dump the dump as as we <laughs> joked inside, um, but also just really allow us to kind of fo focus and emphasize some of our key messaging that we've we've really wanted to do for a long time. Um, we always we always say that um, repowered. We really believe that that everything and everyone has value, and and you know we're we're dealing with with both technology and people for that matter that have been kind of discarded um, from general society and conversations. Um, whereas, you know, we prove everything has value on the technology side of things, right? This is stuff that people have gotten rid of. They, they think that it's broken. Um, they, they just got a, a new TV. It's great. It works for a year and all of a sudden it doesn't power on. They don't have the, uh, the know-how necessarily to make those fixes. So we can, we can do that, um, and resell it, which is great. Obviously our, our main focus is in, is in desktop and laptop computers, but we phones, tablets, everything. There's a lot of value left in these devices when we think that, that there isn't, um, for, for other people. And, and likewise, on the people side of things, um, we employ a lot of people that have been formerly incarcerated that for um, they've they've really struggled to kind of reintegrate, um, not because they're not capable, but because society at large is um, is suspect. Um, so we really try to prove that that those people have value, too, that they are great contributors and great coworkers um, for all of us at, at Repowered. That's awesome. And that was actually something I was wanting to crack into a little bit, because I think in the same way that maybe some of your tech dump customers didn't know that tech discounts was around and had any sort of retail value. It's shocking when you dig into Repowered a little bit more that there is way more than just tech recycling here, because your guys' website is all about that mission to provide fair chances for people, planet and technology, right? And yep cracking into people, it's kind of surprising to learn that there are like work readiness and volunteer opportunities that you guys offer. And it sounds like some of that might work with like helping get previously convicted people back into the working force and general society. Yep, absolutely. So um, kind of another another phrase that that we use um, is that we believe that all all the people here are defined by our futures. Um, so one of the ways that we live that out um, is, is providing those work opportunities to people that um, have experienced uh, the criminal legal system um, or perhaps are in recovery from addiction. Um, oftentimes those things go hand in hand as well, but sometimes they don't. Um, and yeah, every year we provide like hundreds and thousands of employment hours um, and nearly a, a million dollars in wages to kind of provide that practical experience for adults that are facing those barriers um, and just help them be great employees while they're with us as an organization, but then also really kind of setting them up for success down the road. Um, we've got a, essentially an, an 18 month program that, that people come into. So we are 
it, it is it is a job um, that that pays from from day one, um, but we also have a lot of different wraparound services that we provide. Um, a lot of just extra supports that people need, things that a lot of people don't even understand. I I was the first. I'm the first to admit that I did not understand kind of how. Um, of what re-entry look like for people um, and just the seemingly ridiculous hoops that people have to jump through um, even after they've quote unquote served their served their debt to society. Um, there's still a lot that they have to do and and holding down what would be a more traditional job, even if it's part time, um, is just difficult. Um, at any given time, they have to step away oftentimes to meet with the parole officer or go do a, some sort of drug screening or just sure. have all these different meetings. And, you know, even if you're working part-time at, at a grocery store or something like that, to just be like, I got to leave right now to go do this thing. And that's going to yeah. cost you your job, right? Uh, but we've got that flexibility. We understand that this sort of thing happens a lot. Um, so we can just kind of provide that, that flexibility. Um, we offer a lot of other kind of great things uh, at least i th i think we do um a lot of other wraparound services to to help um just this transition back um one of the things that that we do um is we provide a lot of mental health support for people um specifically we've got um a lot of supports around kind of trauma informed care that people have access to um professionals that that can help therapists and things that can help work through issues um, we've got different kind of barrier removal grants where if someone just needs to, needs to get a car because they need to get to work, we can help them, um, get a down payment for their car, or there's all these kind of other micro grants. Maybe there's a, a few fines that they still owe before they can get their license or just a whole number of other things that we can just help support. Um, and we have kind of coaches that are here that can help navigate that system. Um, as well as just like a peer group, because a lot of the people that are here have have um, experienced these problems, you know, and it's hard to find, I mean, it's hard enough for anybody to find housing um, kind of in this day and age. But if you've got a felony, there's a lot of places that that um, that won't rent to you just because of that. And um, so we kind of share resources of kind of felon friendly um, renters and all sorts of things. So so we really try to help people people reintegrate as best they can. Yeah, that's awesome. It can be a real, real whirlwind of a struggle when you start to get caught in that world and mm -hmm. having all of those barriers that the common public might not even have exposure to or know that you're experiencing, I'm sure feels like almost an impossible wall to get over. And those things would be almost interpreted as red flags by your employer, where you've got to go off to a meeting in the middle of the day, and they already might have a bit of a suspicion to you because of your past. But you're really just trying to check all your boxes and keep doing all your responsibilities. Yeah, Ab you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, on the topic of people, with the tech portion of your guys' slogan, I think digital equity is kind of a almost what we're talking about here. Would you be able to kind of explain to the audience what digital equity is? Sure. Um, I mean, kind of in its, in its core definition, um, it's, it's making sure that people um, get access to the same opportunities as everybody else. So it may not just be um, devices um, or things like that. There, there are other things. So a lot of practitioners in the, in the digital equity space um, kind of talk about a three-legged stool. They talk about access to devices capable of connecting to the internet. They talk about actual connections and quality of connections to the internet. Um, and then they talk about digital literacy skills. So those are all kind of the three, three basic pieces of it. Um, obviously for us um, as an organization, we're, we're more on the device side of things. We're trying to provide um, quality, low cost um, technology devices, whether those are, like I said, laptops, desktops, phones, tablets, um, and just making sure that those those devices are available um, at a price point that is at least accessible to to a part of the population that that isn't able to just walk into Best Buy um, or to just go onto Amazon and, and get the latest latest thing. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and then on the on the internet side of things, um, I mean, there is a real 
a real struggle um, that people have just being able to find internet connections. Um, I think a lot of people where that isn't a struggle, um, it's just not even in your brain. Um, the internet is just ubiquitous. It's everywhere, right? Um, you don't really think about it. Um, but there's there's a lot of people that don't, um, that, that, that aren't able to access the internet. And, and just, you know, I always, when, I, when I'm talking with groups, I kind of talk about like, I mean, how many, and it's usually measured in seconds. Um, how many seconds go by in the morning when you first wake up until you're like interacting with a, a connected <laughs> device, right? Yeah. Um, and, and the idea that that just isn't even possible, right? It's just, right. It's just wild. Um, and a lot of people really kind of struggle um, to even understand that's an, that that's an issue. Um, and then on the, the, the connect the, the last piece is really the, the digital literacy side of things. Um, there are people that have access to things, um, have access to, um, devices, um, but there's still a real, um, unease around technology and everybody's different. I mean, not everybody is going to start, you know, start, wanting to go to a, a boot camp and code and, and all of that. Like that's, that I think is kind of a, a problem, right? I think there's a lot of like digital um, equity programs that are trying to do that. Like, like take people like to just turn them into absolute power users, which is great right. for some. And I think those programs are, are awesome and they, they absolutely should exist, but there's still a lot of people that just, um, especially, I mean, there's all sorts of factors that go into kind of what are usually um, kind of telltale signs of of where these kind of divides show up. It's usually around um, race, income, geography, and age are kind of the main spots. So, like, um, for some people, being an, an older person might just be, hey, being able to get on Facebook and see pictures of your grandkids like that's all they need. Like totally. Let's, let's help them figure out how to do that and get the devices they can do that so they can feel connected, you know, and age in place or what all, whatever those terms that that kind of get used to 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 help elderly yeah, people. But then but then there's all sorts of other things um that that we can help just gain familiar familiarity with. Um I think another misconception that happens a lot is there's this term that gets thrown around like digital natives. Like, so, hmm. you know, um, millennials and oh, below, okay. basically age wise, there's just this assumption that people just know how to do it. Like, and by it, you can't see me. I'm just waving yeah. my hands into the air, right? <laughs> it is just this, whatever technology is. They just find some young person. They don't know how to do it. Pointing um, at the internet around you. <laughs> right. But, but so oftentimes, like we realize that's, that's not the case. Um, where I see it most, um, is just around troubleshooting, to be honest. Um, there's so many people that have, have grown up in times where the technology technology just works all the time, that when it doesn't, it's just the ability to like troubleshoot why something isn't working beyond a, a basic like turn it off and turn it back on again is just, is just totally lost. Um, yeah, on that fact, it was actually reminding me of, there was a study that just came out of professors noticing a trend in 2017 of people that had gotten to their college level classes that didn't understand like file directories and folders because they never dealt with a floppy disk. they never dealt with filing cabinets and large quantities of paper. So when they were saving things, they would just dump them in one location on their computer. And when the professor came up and was like, Hey, why are you not organizing these? Cause he was dealing with people that were learning to code and they had obviously tons and tons of files on their desktop. <laughs> he was, he was like, get these into files, get these into folders, organize them. And they just, they didn't have any concept for how to construct that. And it's an interesting trend that's growing where that's not something that people think to teach to the youngest kids because they do assume that they have that just innate knowledge on how to work on these devices but it'll be interesting to find what things start to kind of get missed in those gaps, even in people in developed countries with access to technology. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. To even just, just, I mean, typing skills, I think are, you know, there's just some real basic stuff where if, um, if you're used to just, you know, typing things out on a, on a smart device or just using, using voice, um, 
I mean, maybe it's, I mean, I, I assume at some point in the future, we're going to get there, but, but it, certainly right now we're, we're a long ways off. And, um, and, and the fact that people aren't kind of le learning those, those skills, um, as well as just like how to send an email, um, you know, there's just, there's just a lot of that. And especially on the, some of the stuff where we try to try to, you know, job searching is a great kind of synthesis of all of these, these skills that, that we teach in digital equity, like, how do you apply for a job? I mean, even a job at McDonald's right now is is online. You're not going in to get a right. You're not going in to get a paper application. Um, you know, you can't even half the time I go to my local Chipotle, I can't even walk in and order a order a burrito anymore. I have to do it <laughs> online because they're closed to to yeah. sort of walk in traffic. So like, just being able to just do some of these basic things is like a great way to just kind of like our real world test cases. Um, I was like, all right how are you gonna how are you gonna type up a resume right like yeah yes there's there's services out there that'll kind of do that for you they'll get you started but um there's there's a long way to go with that then how to how to search how to find you know there's a whole nother piece of this of just being able to gauge just quality of content um and you know and finding good sources which is kind of one of the next places that that the digital equity and digital literacy world is kind of going, um, you know, that's a topic for an entirely different podcast, right? But people being able to effectively evaluate online content um, is, is a pretty significant issue right now. Um, really and there's is. a lot of people that, that, that just don't know how to do it. You know, I was on Wikipedia. I found a blog. That's, that's what I need to know. Yeah. And it's such a huge part when you go to college, being able to vet that out is something people spend three years learning and one year proving that they've understood and, and knowing how to do thorough, good research is kind of one of those overarching things that you might take home. And it's, it's tough to teach. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like the, the digital divide that you were kind of mentioning is something that's shrinking as more companies gain an awareness towards this and try to work to fix it or with how fast technology is moving, do you think it's kind of growing and leaving some people in the dust? It's, it's definitely growing, leaving people in the dust. Um, even, even someone with a relatively like hopeful mindset, like I, I think I, I have for the most part, um, there's always going to be whatever the latest, greatest technology that's being sold to us is kind of the next killer app or whatever. It's almost always going to come in at a price point that is outside you know, certainly first early adopters, that technology price point is just going to be too high to really help the people that probably need it most. Um, and, and I, unfortunately, I just, I think that's kind of where we are, but there are yeah. some other just actual trends going on. Um, you know, I, I won't, I won't recite a lot of statistics here, but just a few to, to think about on the device yeah. side of things. Um, about four in 10 adults with incomes below $30,000 don't have access to a desktop or laptop computer. Wow. Um, so, um, that's, yeah. that's so almost that's, that's pretty, half of people right. that are and, under that, that income level. That's shocking. Right. Yep. And, and people are just like, Oh, $30,000. That's pretty low. That's not, that's not, there's not that many people that affects right now that below 30,000 is about 40, one percent of our u.s population so it's wow. it's a significant um yeah, yeah there's that. a lot of people that that affects absolutely um, and or i'm sorry i i i i, sh I said that statistic wrong i'm sorry it's 25 percent of households in the united states make less than thirty thousand oh, dollars so, okay got it so, so it's it's significant so of the twenty five thousand people or i'm sorry of the 25 percent of our U.S. population below thirty thousand, forty percent of those don't have a desktop or laptop computer in their home. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So about one quarter of the entire population is at that number, and then forty percent of those people yeah. are without access to something that is viewed as a lot of people in America as just a feature of your home. <laughs> right. Right. And, like, of course, you have internet and a computer. Right. And and the great equalizer in this, I will admit, though, like is cell phone um, or I should say smartphone ownership is I, I had mentioned before kind of the factors of of um, race, income, age and geography. Um, 
Smartphones have kind of been a great equalizer in that regard. About eight in 10 people, regardless of white, black, Hispanic, um, eight in 10 adults have access to a smartphone, which okay. is, which is, which is good. However, you know, the details as, as certainly people in technology understand, not all plans are the same, right? Um, there are going to be caps on certain, certain, um, like the data plans, the data plans. Exactly. Yeah. And, and some of them are kind of pay as you go. And then you get, it's a little, you can, you can spend a lot. <laughs> uh, I was about to say the same thing goes where if you don't know what the standard is and you get into one of those pay as you go plans, you could be spending compared to what someone else might look like. That's ready to spend 50 or 80 or a hundred bucks on their line. That'd be a lot per gigabyte or megabyte of data that you're getting. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so I, some of those stats that I had mentioned before were kind of related to devices as it relates to internet, um, about, um, so again, this $30,000 a year household income, that's about 25% of households. Um, about a quarter of those people are smartphone only internet users. So there is no other access that they have in their home to internet other than their data plan. Oh, okay, so they don't even have Wi-Fi at home. It's just going to be the data plan from their phone. Yeah. Okay. That kind of begs how often people are then trying to go to internet cafes and get out of their house. But that is, that's just not a, a consistent enough work environment, I don't think. Right. Um, it, this was certainly the case a few years ago. I don't know. And by a few years ago, I mean like five years ago. It it may still be the case when I was doing more work um, throughout rural Minnesota. Um on any given evening, there was a lot of people parked in the the public library parking lot, McDonald's oh. parking lot, just trying to connect to an internet um, source. There was a lot of government buildings that would turn off their Wi-Fi at night just because they didn't want people on their networks. But then they realized, oh, this is this is a service that we can we can provide. So I, that's not as much the issue anymore. But there's a lot of places that were yeah because there's i mean there's not internet cafes in a lot of rural parts of of our country so if there's a if there's a business that's got got wi-fi they're they're sitting in the parking lot that is an interesting angle i hadn't even thought of of just getting up in your car within range and and then you're good to go yeah so one thing i kind of wanted to tap into but we got a little past if i was someone looking to get involved in that work readiness program Mm -hmm. What do the positions look like on the back end or what do you prepare people for? Are they ready to manually start working on devices with their hands? Are they going to be software developers? Does it just find them a nice spot to launch in the tech space or in a career? Sure. Um, so when we first start things, unless someone has some very specific um, work histories of working with technology, um, they may take a little bit of a different course through our through our program, but oftentimes it starts out more a little bit on the production of uh, kind of demanufacturing first. So okay. there is a lot of um, to kind of paint a little bit of a picture. These there are these um, we just have these giant boxes just full of equipment that businesses and residents are are getting rid of that we just need to go through and and sort first um mm -hmm. that that's a spot that a lot of people will start on um we're just identifying good from bad and kind of where sure. our technical cut lines in um you have to remember too you know when people have been um incarcerated for five or ten years um even i mean if you were incarcerated 15 years ago the iphone had just come out right i mean yeah. the amount of technology change in that amount of time even just in a year or two it's just it's a completely different world when they come out so a lot of it is just like identifying like helping people identify the difference between um a a monitor and an all-in-one computer for example like they kind of look similar but they're different how do you absolutely tell the difference right um what's the difference between a rack mounted server and a rack mounted ups system or a, or a switch they kind of look similar but they're different just being able to do some of that sort of kind of basic product identification yeah um, is is one kind of entry point another entry point is just kind of the 
the the demanufacturing of things. So we we do as much reuse as we can, but there are just some things we're going to get that were are too old for us to work on. So we're going to kind of basically take out all the screws out of those things, get them into their kind of basic components, circuit boards, plastics, metals, um, and then kind of sort things that way. And people will just kind of learn learn that process. And again, while they're still getting all the wraparound services from that, that we provide. Um, and then as people um, get more comfortable with those processes, there's, there's opportunities that are then available, what we call in our test and repair department. So actually powering on systems. Um, if they don't power on, why aren't they? Can we fix it? Um, That's such a huge key. Right. And then, and then learning to make those fixes, um, learning to repair, do some kind of basic repair. Um, we have a few times we get down to kind of like soldering level repairs, but more often oh, than wow. not, we're, we're, that's not where we spend a lot of our time. Um, but we also, in those positions, we, we do a lot of direct hires as well. So it's not necessarily people that are in the program doing that work. It's people that have industry experience. But it's, it's a great opportunity for people to work kind of side by side next to people that have that industry experience. Um, so, you know, when, when someone leaves here, they, they could they could easily go, you know, work in a, in a, in a department in a larger organization that's, that's just doing refreshes, right. Or some basic, um, um, uh, IT department work. Oh yeah. Um, so, so there's definitely though, there's opportunities to get those skills. Um, and those, those skills are just such a basic kind of digital literacy to the world we live in now that that is something I think you take home and you would use even in your personal experience at a job in a completely different industry. It's amazing how many of my friends have reached out with their desktop not being able to power on. And that's a full stop. There's no troubleshooting steps they take to try to solve it. And just kind of being able to work through those on your own and knowing the different things to try out can be really enabling. Yeah. 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 It's definitely... Yeah, it's the you know to to see someone go from not really um, knowing that much about technology to like building their own gaming rig, right? It's just, yeah. it's cool to it's I mean it's the you don't really get to tinker on cars that much anymore. They're all computers on wheels, right? But exactly. but actually working on computers is one of those ways that people can kind of get some of that satisfaction of uh of going from from not knowing much to to doing some pretty cool stuff. I love that comparison. And those are two of my passions. I, as a, a teenager in high school, always loved doing my own oil changes and trying to work on my brakes and stuff. But then yeah. that uh, it got complex and expensive and the, the shop does a great oil change. Yeah. So now I play with my computer a little bit and change out the pieces. Yeah. You, you found another potentially expensive uh, hobby. <laughs> there, but... <laughs> yeah, exactly. So one pillar we haven't really touched much on is the planet from Repowered's mission. What do your services do besides the, the, the reuse, which is obviously great to save waste to help with the environment? Yeah. So we, since, since our inception in 2011, we've processed about 40 million pounds of e-waste. Um, so that's stuff that um, was able to divert kind of a, a landfill end right so we've um we take in pretty much like i said we focus really on the on the resale of of desktop laptop kind of consumer electronics but we do really take anything that that plugs into the wall um that's okay. not an that's not an appliance so um or not a major appliance but if you're sure. you know we recycle lamps and toasters and things like that um but but really the and most of that comes from just the residential customer, um, our sure. ITAD services, um, to continue the, uh, the three legged stool analogy. Um, the, the, those legs in the ITAD industry are really, the recycling is just one component of that. Um, mm -hmm. we also provide data destruction services as well as the refurbishment and potential like value back to the customer. That's, that's, recycling with us. So if a business has 50 laptops they're looking to get rid of, um, and they're still valuable, um, we might be able to provide, um, we might be able to purchase those assets from them. 
you know, so then that's money that they can use to go out for their next refresh or whatever it is that they want to do with it. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're keeping a lot of, a lot of e-waste. Um, we're processing a lot. Um, e-waste is the fastest growing um, waste stream in the world. Um, we're just being kind of overrun with it. And a lot of stuff that you don't really even think of as e-waste um, is at this point. And a lot of things have a, a timer and a circuit board in it. So whether it's light up shoes or a light up backpack as people are going back to school, they think it's oh, kind of yeah. fun to, to do that. But it's like, hey, that's that's e-waste that you can't you're not supposed to throw that stuff in the in the garbage when you're done with it. Um, Which is so interesting that that I feel like that should be driven home way more that those kind of devices aren't just meant for the normal trash because that just feels like such a predominant understanding. Yeah. 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 There, there's a little tiny marking, you know, that's got like a little trash can with the line through it, but they, they, they don't do much. And, and unfortunately there's not much oversight of, of the manufacturers that kind of pump this stuff out as well. Um, they can kind of just do it. And, and we, as a, as a society are going to have to, um, deal with that later. Yeah. And you mentioned about a larger company potentially wanting to recycle their old technology. Yeah. Is it just if they wouldn't want you to see like a specific video or a confidential document that's on there or what liabilities might expose themselves if they just dump all of it out? Sure. So we have, um, we've got certifications um, from both a handling of e-waste perspective, but also of data security um, we provide, and we're not going to be turning anything on until the drives have been either sanitized or destroyed. Um, so we, we can provide businesses like an entire inventory list of all the assets that we picked up, including serial numbers of not only like the, the devices that they came from, but the actual serial numbers of, um, of the data containing device itself. So if there was a hard drive that was removed, you'd get the um, serial number of that hard drive um, and kind of what happened to it, whether it was, we, we try to reuse as much as we can. So we have mm -hmm. um, sanitization methods that, that write ones and zeros and all sorts of different levels of complexity over, over disks to, to essentially um, purge them of any, or sanitize them of any data that was on them. Um, but then there are times where either businesses they they don't want that service or um or sometimes if the um sanitization fails for any reason we have this giant sh hard drive shredder on site that we just kind of make <laughs> hard drive hard drive confetti out of um and and we can and that that's essentially what we do so okay. we're really just we're we're dealing with as soon as a, a business um would request those services. I mean, everything, everything that we get, whether, um, whether the business specifically asks for it or not goes through a similar process of either being sanitized or destroyed. Um, but if they want that extra kind of auditing of, of serial numbers and everything, that's something that we're easily set up to, to provide. Um, and then we just, we make an entire report for them, send it back. And then they're, IT and uh, compliance teams are usually um, feel pretty good about what we, what we can send back to them. Sure. And I guess I'm familiar with reformatting a hard drive or like an SD card for when you take pictures. Yep. That involves powering it on and kind of going into the settings. How do you, mm -hmm. does your guys's company have some sort of like machine that it plugs into to sanitize separately from the device? Yeah. Yep. So we're we, the easiest way for us to to do things um, is to just remove media when it's possible. So if if there's a hard drive that can be removed, we're going to remove it. We'll put it into an appliance that we have that just as soon as you plug it in, it starts it starts doing its thing, um, and and wiping the drive or overwriting the drive really. Sure. Um, and in instances where where um, storage is is like soldered onto a board or something like that where we can't actually remove it mm -hmm. um we've got kind of different methods um a lot of network over the network sorts of the same software that we would in, that we would run inside this appliance we can also run on a on a per unit um basis as well so so sometimes it's in unit 
wiping. Um, but just from a scalability standpoint, it's it's the easiest if we can remove the drives. Yeah, no, that, that sounded like magic to me. So I had to ask a little bit more about yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> so if people are wanting to learn a little bit more about Repowered, where can they go to follow along? Yeah, um, our, our website is getrepowered.org. And any of our kind of ma major social media sites, um, we always use the the name at Get Repowered, um, so that you'd find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, all those all those normal places. That's great, um, Sam. I appreciate the conversation. Do you have any other thoughts or comments or questions that came up throughout that you'd like to add on? In what you had asked before about whether the digital divide is getting bigger. Um, Certainly the pandemic has shown that to be the case. Um, you know, nine in 10 um, parents have said that their kids had to have, has had to do some form of online instruction since February of 2020. Um, and not surprising, um, income is, the people that have lower incomes definitely run into problems more often. Um, and it, whether it's, they have to do their schoolwork on a cell phone, whether they don't have a computer at home or whether they don't have a Wi-Fi um, connection or, or any sort of broadband internet connection at home is really um, is really an issue. And thankfully, the pandemic has, has shown a little bit of a light on it, but it's still still very much a problem. Yeah. Um, and again, just to, to reiterate um, that, that we think every that Repowered thinks that that all people and our technology still have still have value um, is is just something I really want to make sure that people understand that that we work with a, a group of people that want to work they want to to be <laughs> just seen as as quote unquote regular people right they, there's, yeah. there's some mistakes that that have been made in the past but they're ready to, to move on and certainly in a time when um, Minnesota is, has got some pretty low unemployment, um, numbers as, as businesses are looking to hire. Um, a lot of them are still, a lot of businesses still ask whether, um, someone has a felony or not. Um, I would, if that's, if that is your business and you're still, um, asking those questions, I would just really ask to reflect on that. And what is it that you're trying to get out of that? that question and what sort of assumptions are you making that, that maybe you should reassess? Yeah. I, I love that because it's kind of that feast over famine mindset where there is absolutely enough work to go around and just making sure everyone can have that equal opportunity to take part and learn is, is wonderful. It's kind of the community over competition. Absolutely. And, um, and yeah, if, if people are looking for, I mean, the other reality too, is it's not like many of us have just one device, right? We've got multiple devices, um, especially people that have, have, have more money, um, you know, repowered might not be the place they go to, to buy their first device, but if they're looking for that second or third device, or they've got young kids and you're like, oh man, I'm not about ready to drop $350 on an iPad. <laughs> to this kid that's going to yeah. just drop it down the stairs. Um, you know, go, go in the refurbished route is a great way to do that. Um, just financially, it, it makes a lot of sense. So, yeah. Um, and, and when you're buying from us, you're helping our entire program and helping um, these people that, that we work with just get, get those skills that they need to, to reenter our society as, as best as they can and really be ready to contribute. Yeah. And I think being able to to buy refurbished, especially from a local company like your guys's, where you can go back in and ask questions about the device really adds another level of comfort to it, as opposed to just getting something shipped in from somewhere that it feels kind of irreturnable. Absolutely. And and we offer repair services in our stores as well. So, I mean, to your friend that, that couldn't get their desktop to, uh, to turn on, they could certainly come into either our, our Golden Valley or our St. Paul store and... Um, and have that serviced and looked at at a at a rate that is uh, I would argue is far more competitive uh, than some of the, your major brands and retailers. Yeah, and I mean it. It's amazing when you start to go to some local people for repair. I had a broken iPhone screen that I was certain was going to be over two hundred dollars, and they were very reasonable. It was yeah. 
under 200. And then I went back in a few weeks later with problems and it was uh, like a manufacturer's warranty issue. And in 10 minutes he had another new screen in the iPhone and I was walking out the same day with it. So it's awesome. Local repair is absolutely worth the exploration. Mm -hmm. Awesome, Sam. Well, if people want to stay connected with you, is there anywhere good or just LinkedIn that they should follow you? Yeah. Yeah. LinkedIn is LinkedIn is best. Awesome. Well, great, Sam. I appreciate the conversation today and I hope you have a great rest of yours. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, Michael. Thanks to Sam Drong for joining the show today. You can find him as well as our host, Michael Roth, on LinkedIn. Direct links can be found in our show notes, which are at constantvariables.co. You can get in touch with anyone here at the show by emailing hello at constantvariables.co. And you can also find us on Twitter at CV underscore podcast. Today's episode was produced by Jenny Karkowski and edited by the ultimate Jordan Doust. This episode was brought to you by the Jed Mahonis Group. Check us out at jmg.mn and sign up for our monthly newsletter at jmg.mn slash news.